Welcome to another edition of the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Thanks for checking in. I hope you're well. I'm doing very well. So, today I've had the pleasure of interviewing one of my favourite singers from one of my favourite bands. I've been talking to Devin Graves from the band Psychotic Walls. Now, I've been a Psychotic Walls fan since the very word go. So, if you don't know the band, you really need to check out this unique, fantastic band. So, if you don't know about Psychotic Walls, the band was formed in California and released their first demo back in 1986 under the name of Oslan. Now after that the band charged to change the name to Psychotic Walls and released their debut album back in 1990 which was called A Social Grace. Originally released on their own label Subsonic Records and later on licensed to Rise and Some Records in Germany. Now Social Grace is a fantastic album. Very strange, lot of technicality. Now the frontman Devin Graves who I interviewed recently, is also the plays the flute, so you will hear this on the album. He's a fantastic musician, great singer, a great composer, great at writing lyrics. So, the first album, like I said, Social Grace, was recorded back in 1990. The second album, Into the Everflow, was released on Dream Circle Records, and was a fantastic follow-up. This was followed up by the third album, which was called Into, uh, Mosquito, released in 1994. And in 1996, the album Bleeding, both of those albums were released on Bulletproof Records, which is part of Music for Nations. All four albums are fantastic. Now, the band broke up, unfortunately. Devin Whitney did his own thing, a band called Dead Soul Tribe, which released five albums on Inside Out. Interesting band, different, slightly different to Psychotic Walls, but still a very interesting band. So, the band reformed in later years and toured Europe with Symphony X and Nevermore. Unfortunately, I missed that tour. And I have seen the band seven times live in Europe, but I missed that tour. And if you saw that tour, what a show that must have been. So, the band reformed and also made a new album back in 2020 on new label Inside Out Records, which is called The God Shaped Void. A fantastic album, well worth checking out, and I just hope the band tour very soon. So, as this interview was a very long interview, I've had to break it up into a couple of parts. So please enjoy, share, please leave comments. Please share on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and social media groups as well as Facebook groups. So thank you Devin Grace for the interview. It was a pleasure talking to you. Finally after waiting 20 years for the interview. I know we've met several times but we've never had the opportunity to get this interview until now. But thank you so much. To the guys in Socratic Walls, be safe. I hope to see you all again soon. It'd be nice to catch you and have a drink. So thank you for watching. Be safe metalheads. More interviews coming soon. Thanks for watching. Hey man, how are you? Hey, good to see you, Devin. So how you doing, man? Nice oh, shirt. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously, the gods of prog metal, aren't they? <laughs> how's that? Yeah, I'm good, man. How are you? I'm well. I'm good under the circumstances, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. So, how have you found the uh, COVID situation? Have you been creative since the time you've been in COVID lockdown? Not as creative as I should have been, you know. I mean, I there was like. Two years, I could have probably taken a little better advantage of this time, but, but, um, I mean, in ways I have, but just not in, not musically. And I'm kind of getting back to that now. Um, the whole band is kind of uh, talking about this, you know. Um, I've been actually like writing music and recording music very, very recently. So, right. Okay, then, yeah, I've, I've been quite creative. I've been doing interviews because I've just set up this YouTube channel, as you know. So this is like, this is actually the first interview I've done with you, but I've interviewed um, Ward before, but it's been so long. I've been trying to get this interview with you for like 20 years. <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> totally bizarre. Yeah, funny, funny. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for doing this interview. So I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first, Evan. So right. as, a, as a singer, who inspired you? What came first? Was it the guitar, the flute, or vocals? What, what came first in your musical life? Well, it's funny you should ask because, um, you know, you mentioned, do, you know, this YouTube channel and and I actually am doing one of them. Um, I was considering doing one of my own. I got some pretty good feedback. It looks like a, enough people would want to watch it. Um, and, you know, if I was to play acoustic guitar and sing, I could only do that for so long before I, you know, run out of things to do. You know, I couldn't really sustain a channel on that. So I was thinking like what kind of subjects could I do you know and and I was going to make a video on 
how I became a singer and what what my path was. So I could probably just tell you now and then I'll just like uh, record my end of it here. <laughs> um, I started with guitar, but I always wanted to be a singer. I always wanted to be a singer before I could even play guitar. You know, I when I was in like fourth grade, I remember uh, I was really into 50s music from from 10 years old, I think the, the movie American Graffiti got me, and my older brother got me really into 50s music. And and um, I listened to the American Graffiti soundtrack and then I started collecting 50s records. All from my birthdays, I would get 50s records. They called them oldies but goodies. You find them in the oldies but goodies section. And now what do we find in there? <laughs> we find like 80s bar- bands now. Yeah, like the bargain bins as we call them. But yeah, but this was in the 70s. So the oldies were from the 50s. And I collected t- just tons of records. And I used to pretend I was singing. You know, I used to pretend to sing. And and um, I guess the seed got planted by not knowing my father, but knowing he was a really good singer, according to my mother. Um, and who I found out later was, in fact, a really good singer. Um, <clears throat> so that probably planted the seeds, you know. But uh, when I started playing guitar, though, I was I was 11 or 12, just turning 11. Like on my 12th birthday, I got a bunch of little accessories for this acoustic guitar I took out of my dad's closet. And... Um, and I started learning learning a Buddy Holly songs, and of course I would try to sing them, you know. But I was more playing. And then um, <clears throat> a long-haired fifteen-year-old uh, moves in next door to me, also with an acoustic guitar, sitting out on the summer uh, summer vacation, sitting out in the back of his truck, playing his guitar. So I'd bring my guitar and play my Buddy Holly to him. Then I borrowed a couple of his Zeppelin records. So I was playing these songs he was teaching me. I was playing them. And um, then I borrowed the records. And I listened to like Led Zeppelin and Led Zeppelin II. And, and, and I'm like, I'm playing that? Wow, that's awesome, man. And then, then I had to have an electric guitar. And um, <clears throat> I started taking guitar lessons still with that acoustic guitar. And my guitar teacher taught me to put electric guitar strings on the acoustic guitar so that I could play electric guitar songs, you know, bend the strings and, and uh, the strings, electric guitar strings are a lot softer. So, so it's easier to play electric guitar music. I'm playing electric guitar music on the acoustic. And uh, so boot camp for guitar for me was learning how to play hard rock with an acoustic guitar. And then the first Christmas when I was 13 I got an electric guitar and I had my dad's Fender amplifier that didn't have distortion I'd love to have that amplifier it got stolen but this uh, Fender super reverb four 10 inch speakers really nice amp no distortion I had no distortion and my mom wouldn't buy me a distortion pedal so I'm playing now for like two years heavy rock music on the electric guitar with no distortion (laughs) so i really really had it was really like boot camp for me um and i would try singing and i would give up i would try and i would give up try and i would give up you know but i would stick with guitar and um then i got two records i got i got my brother bought me um i think this was be when i was 14 following year christmas my brother bought me an album called rainbow on stage and uh by this time i was really into hendrix i was just learning hendrix that's all i did at my guitar lessons is just learn Jimi hendrix so like i get this rainbow album and I got really into that record. I start. I really liked Ronnie James Dio's voice. And I think that Ronnie James Dio made me want to be a singer. 
but what what was happening is i was i would like i would write songs by this time i was writing music writing my own hard rock metal whatever you want to call it and um and i was writing the lyrics and i was you know singing this stuff but my intention was to find a singer like i'd want someone like dio or someone like bruce dickinson and i'd be playing guitar and i need to find this great singer and i would um i guess i kind of tricked my voice into developing by walking around singing dio just walking around like you know um singing it kind of under my breath you know like not belting it out but like and it kind of developed my voice and then what ended up happening was the few people i would audition as singers and i would teach them the songs it always kind of sound better if i would sing it than when they sang it you know and what ended up happening was i started getting asked to sing for bands i was i wanted to be a guitarist i wanted to be a lead guitarist but i kept getting asked to sing for bands and i the first few I turned them down. I want to play guitar, you know, but um, and that, uh, and then the first time, the first time I realized I could sing was about sixteen years old, and my mom bought me a microphone, like this twenty-five dollar microphone for Christmas. And I even remember being kind of pissed because because it it seemed uh, like what am I going to do with a microphone, you know, a, a guitar player? I wondered. I was hoping she was going to buy me a new Stratocaster or something. And <laughs> she got me this microphone. I knew Dan back then, and I even told her he he probably remember when I was saying I was pissed off because I got this microphone. And but like a year later, I kind of I had this little Yamaha guitar amp with two inputs, and and this microphone had like a guitar plug and not not like the little three prong uh, yeah. XLR plug, but uh, just it looked just like a guitar plug. So I could plug the mic into the guitar amp along with the guitar. And I just, and, and I could also plug headphones into this guitar amp. So I had I had this this queen size bed with these tall poles, you know, on, on each of the corners. And um, I, I didn't have a mic stand, you know, I just had this microphone and some electrical tape <laughs> and I electrical tape the microphone to the to the bed pole and um turn on some reverb the amp just had reverb and but it at least it had a little distortion you know and um and I start playing number of the beast okay and then I sing into this this mic you know and dude, I lived alone you know and hearing it through the headphones for the first time it sounded really good to me and then I would get it out yeah and I and I did the scream and I could do the scream. I just could do it. And and I went like I kept playing, kept singing, and I was really kind of crushing it, you know, like the with ever not having been in had any, any vocal lessons. I just it just came out. And um yeah, so I start was playing and singing, playing and singing, writing songs and and uh including stuff that was psychotic waltz material years later um writing these songs that i would play guitar and sing i was going to be a guitar singer kind of like hendrix and um but like i said i was not getting asked to play guitar in bands i was getting asked only to sing and um i got kind of used to that and by the time i met dan you know well not met him but i knew him but by the time i um, I knew him and Brian from grade school, but after high school, uh, I went and um, was invited to go see Dan's, Dan's band rehearse. My friend Billy, we were just driving around. What band was that, Dan's what band was that yeah, Devin? Sure. What band was that? They were called Oslon at the oh, time. Oh yeah, I was going to talk to you about them later on, but yeah, I'll carry on. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I knew Dan was getting good at guitar. Um, he and I jammed together when I was 15. I, I actually was one of his, I, I taught him how to play at first. He knew how to play a couple of folk songs, you know, but I taught him how to play like Alice Cooper and uh, we played 18 by Alice Cooper. And I don't know what else, you know, but I, I 
kind of got him on to some, playing some rock music. And, um, but he ended up taking lessons from Craig Goldie and getting really good. I, I kind of moved away and was just practicing in my room, kind of not knowing what he was up to. He was taking lessons from Craig, um, <clears throat> had gotten in a band with Brian, and I haven't heard any of their work, you know, but I knew that he was getting really good. And he was really this really disciplined kind of player. And I was more like a blues player, just kind of jamming, but he was like practicing his scales with a metronome, you know, as, as was Brian, I guess. And um, anyway, so when I went in to see this band, I, I walked in and, and it was in the very same jam room that they had always been in all these years until recently. And um, oh my God, they, they played a song called Rahaja <laughs> that, that I, they had another singer and he was like a kind of a Bruce Dickinson influenced singer. He wasn't quite at Bruce Dickinson's level, but you could tell he was a fan. And um, <clears throat> they had this song called Rahaja that just floored me. And, and I didn't, I, I said, oh God, man, if I could sing for this band, oh my God. <laughs> And um, they asked me if I wanted to sing just for fun. And they asked me if I knew the trooper. That's not my favorite maiden song, but I, I, I'll do it, you know. And um, we, we played it and uh, I busted that one out. And I remember Norm saying he had to hide his smile because they were really good friends with Mike. The singer's name was Mike and, and I think and um, he, Norm said he had to like hide his smile. And, and, and after Mike, Mike Hall, after Mike left, I said, hey, can, can you guys give me a tape of your music without that singing on it? And, and they did. And then I took this tape and then I, like 19 at this time, still had that Yamaha guitar amp and those headphones and that microphone. And I plugged their music into that amp and sang. And, and I took that song Rahaja and I changed the vocal melodies and the, I just, I had not none of his work. I just had the music and I wrote, um, I renamed that song Spiral Tower. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I I wrote I wrote Spiral Tower, a song called Back Again, a song called Burn the Night, a song called The Keeper, which the middle section of The Keeper is actually a song called Ashes. The Keeper is a much longer song and Ashes was the middle section of The Keeper. Is any of these songs is any of these songs actually on on YouTube, Devin? Can you hear these songs? These real early stuff. Is it available? No. Oh, it sucks. I'd love to hear no, it. <laughs> no, I, I wrote those five songs in one sitting. And I remember that song, Rahaja, when I had Spiral Tower, was the third song on the list. And I was like, I, I'll write it, but i got to write them in order, you know? And, and so I had to kind of like hold back. And that was the, the third song I wrote, but I wrote them all in the same afternoon. And that was actually amazing because like if to think of that now, to have a head full of so many ideas. I remember that back then I had all these ideas what I will write a song about, you know? And well, I've knocked all those out. And so I, I had so many ideas. I could, I, it baffles me that I wrote five songs in one afternoon because now it takes me a year to write the lyrics to one song to start, you know, like lyrics take me forever now because I, I, I guess it's kind of like long story too long, but this is a warm up question. <laughs> uh, but um, <clears throat> anyway, anyway, I had secretly written eight songs for this for these guys, and they never heard them and never knew about them. And so I guess they decided to ask me to be in the band, and they brought me down, and I already had eight songs written and um it just it just went from there i guess i became a singer you know wow so i mean you started playing flute when did the flute come in then 
back when I was the, the, with the tape on the microphone, it was about about at that time when I was 16, 17 years old. Um, that I, the first time I heard Aqualung was when I was five years old. I found the record uh, in my dad's record collection because he was a horn player, not a rock fan, but a horn player, a really, really good one, my stepdad. And uh, I found Aqualung and the album cover scared me. And I remember listening to the music and the music scared me, but I liked it. And um, that's just kind of like a, a footnote to the backstory to when um, I'm now okay, 16 years old, solid as a uh, aspiring guitar player, trying to learn how to sing uh, really seriously in high school, but seriously into music. And um, I remember watching this, um, it was a TV special and it had nothing but kick ass live 70s rock, like versions, live versions, like they'll show you Deep Purple for, they, I remember they played the song, No, No, No. And um, just band after band after band, like these really killer um, performances. And they had Jethro Tull who, I remember Jethro Tull and they, it was black and white, this footage. And they, they played, this was 1971, it said 1971, but it was the song, No Lullaby. And you know, that didn't get released till much later. I don't know, 76 or something. It came out on heavy horses, but, but I was like reintroduced to Jethro Tull with this 1971 version of No Lullaby. And it floored me, man. It was fucking good. And I was like, yeah, I, I forgot about that band, Jethro Tull. I'm going to get go check them out. And then I got really into that group, like got every record. And oh, I just really got into that group. And um, I had another guitar amp that I actually traded for a flute. And um, I put the flute together and just started listening to Jethro Tull and copying, copying it. And, and it was kind of easy. It was kind of easy. Like, like I remember that by the ninth day, I could already play Cross-Eyed Mary, including the flute solo. Well, I mean, I'm sure I wasn't that good at the flute solo, but I could play it, but I could play the intro and, and the flute was just really easy, especially the way they, it was arranged on the Tull records. Cause it was just in this open E key. So it's just kind of a straight line and, and it's, it's just not that hard. And I got just really into it. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I kept that with me the whole time. Well, wow, it's amazing because you are a fantastic singer and flute player. I mean, you're one of my favorite, I'm not going to lie to you, Devin, you are one of my favorite singers of all time. I think I've oh. told you, I've told you this before when I've met you. You have, and I, I really appreciate that, man, because not a lot of people like my singing. You oh, know? man, no, you, you're, you're unique. You've got a unique voice and style. I mean, for me, my two favourite progressive metal bands of all time are Fates Warning and Psychotic Waltz. Nobody beats them. Who, who, who do you like in Fates Warning? Do you like John Arch? Uh, I like them both. I mean, I, I, like, I like Spectre Within was a great album, but I also yeah. like No Exit, which was Ray's first album. Yeah, yeah, the, the everything. I think those guys as a band got like better and better and better. But between what is what's the name of the um, guy that replaced John Arch? Is it uh, um, Railder? Railder, Railder. Yeah, yeah. That he's very good. We we I heard of Fate's Warning when we were in the very beginning, and and it would be fair to say that listening to Fate's Warning and King Diamond kind of influenced us to be a little more progressive um <clears throat> but it most certainly and and um hearing um hearing john arch got me to experiment a little more acrobatically with the with the the vocals because when i joined psychotic i was still all about ronnie james dio i mean really that that the, between dio and alice cooper <clears throat> that's what made me want to be a singer deal for the singing and Alice Cooper for his showmanship. I, I just, both of those really made me want to be a singer. Go ahead, set the guitar down and just be a front man, let's say. Um, but Dio was the man for, for vocals. I just idolized him. I just, I had that rainbow record. And then I finally found, you know, being a Hendrix fan and Hendrix had been dead for 10 years 
when I was a kid, but you know, when I was really into Hendrix and um, it was neat to have a band that exists that I could get into. I was really happy about that. And then I, and, and I remember also being exposed to black Sabbath back then um, when I was 14, I had a friend that was jamming these old, the first black Sabbath record. And he was jamming that all the time. And I remember thinking, this is the most killer music. This music is the best music there is. I couldn't get past Ozzy's voice though. I didn't like him at first. I love him now, but at first I didn't like his singing. <clears throat> I think it was because I was hearing that the first Sabbath album. And I think that Ozzy recorded that record in a day or something, but I love the music. I love the music and, um, and f like really loved it. <laughs> and um, I remember then, okay, now my sister, who was uh, two years older than me, she was a big musical influence to me. She'd, she'd be the one passing these records to me. Try this, try this, try this. And she was told me, yeah, Dio quit Rainbow. I'm like, oh, you know, but he joined Black Sabbath. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and my sister was the one who played me the Heaven and Hell album. And I was like, okay, I'm on board. I'm fine with this, man. I'm good. And, and I really like that Dio in Black Sabbath when I was 16 years old, 15, 16, I guess, 15, 16. That was just the best thing ever. And I even got to see the Mob Rules tour. And, and it was just like, oh, my God. Uh, I couldn't believe they were... Um, playing like the song Black Sabbath, War Pigs, you know, that old Aussie stuff with Dio singing. It was like, to me, I just loved it. And I mean, I kind of, I kind of lost track of how I even got onto the, this guy, I guess we, we were talking about like face warning and stuff and my singing. But anyway, anyway, my, when I first was with, well, Oslan, as it were, yeah, my singing range was a little more in the Dio area, you know. And um, I remember, you know, I was a fan of Ian Gillen and Robert Plant and and um, Rob Halford, and, but I never, I, I never considered singing that high myself. I didn't think it was possible, you know. And um, there was this local band called Infrared, and they had this really good singer. He he sounded like the spitting image of Jeff Tate. I mean, he was a young kid and he sounded, he sang really, really good. And he had that kind of range. And I think that that kind of pushed me into like, I think I got to kind of step up my game here, you know, and like start learning how to sing high, which, um, which I did pretty quick, you know? So your, uh, your, your influences are then Jimi Hendrix, Mike Anderson, and Dio, your three main influences, would you be saying? Uh, my three early, earliest influences, most definitely, in my formative, in my musical, formative musical years, that would be the, the cast of characters. I was also a super big Richie Blackmore fan. I loved Blackmore. I really idolized him. I mean... You know, I loved when Dio moved to Sabbath, but but to me, when Dio was in Rainbow, when you had Richie Blackmore, Ronnie James Dio, Cozy Powell in the same band, I, when you watch the, the, the Dio singing, and then when he's finished singing, then it goes over to Richie Blackmore, and then you get to feast your eyes and ears on Richie, and then, like, as it goes back and forth, and it's like never a dull moment, you know, like, it's just you know um the trade-off is perfect you know like richie richie isn't uh, to me um a good example of a rhythm guitarist i think that tony iomi is like the rhythm riffs riff masters you know but but richie blackmore kind of well he has some cool riffs like smoke on the waters but but a lot of his playing is kind of in the background you know? so it's a perfect thing where like he's kind of stepping back Dio comes forward, then Dio steps back and Richie comes forward. It was just a beautiful ballet that they had going. 